Hello, my name is Jen Trost. I graduated in May 2016 from CEHD or OLPD um, in higher ed. And so now I work at Century College as their director for partnerships and collaborations, working on dual enrollment or concurrent enrollment. And I apologize if you do not know what concurrent enrollment is. I don't have a lot of time to give the definitions of it, but the idea that high school students receive college credit while they are in high school. So that's what I was looking at, the crossover between K-12 and higher ed, because I really enjoy both institutions and working within the complexities of both of those. Um, I did a mixed methods um, dissertation. So my quantitative looked at public high school graduates from the class of 2011. I used SLEDS data for that. And then I followed up with a case study of two high minority high schools in the same school district um, to find out what the actual practice was of getting students into dual enrollment courses. So I'll start out initially with what um, I found out from the SLEDS, the key pieces there. So from SLEDS, I found out that the participation rate was 13% lower for graduates of color in participation rates in dual enrollment. So either PSEO or concurrent enrollment or articulated credit, but we won't, we won't go there with that. So there was a difference of 13 percentage points between those. And roughly about um, 27 to 28% of, of our graduate population, so these are all high school graduates, um, participated in any form of dual enrollment. But then the number's there. What we also found is that they didn't um, participate proportionate to their graduation rates, and the, and the largest gap was for black African American students. So they represented 7% of graduates, but only 4% of dual enrollment participants. So not a huge gap, but also remember that these are, we're looking at graduates, and we already know that there's an achievement gap and a gap in the number of students, that we graduate, students of color that we graduate. So the gap could be much larger if we were looking at any student who was enrolled in a high school. Um, <clears throat> we also then they looked at participation rates by schools that were predominantly white versus high minority high schools. And I used the definition that the Department of Education uses for high minority high schools. So I looked at anything with that was 37.5% or more students of color, which obviously does not put them in a majority, but that um, represents about a quarter of our high schools in the state of Minnesota. And so between those, you could see that there was a gap between the participation rates. So at predominantly white high schools, 76% of, of the high schools had one or more student participating in dual enrollment, compared to 62% of high minority high schools. So about a 14 point um, gap there between participation rates. And this could have meant one student taking a PSEO course at a high school, um, or, um, so we were looking at any variation there. If I had gone to larger numbers, it would be a much different gap. Um, between those, but just any student. So now moving into my case study, which um, provides some really rich information for how the actual practice of concurrent enrollment and PSEO takes place, how we recruit students, what our student, what our high schools look like in engaging students with those opportunities. So my first high school, they all have pseudonyms, Russell High School, there I interviewed counselors and teachers and students that were participants in dual enrollment. Um, and at this high school, white students were overrepresented in concurrent enrollment, so opportunities to get high school credit in the high or college credit in the high school by 3%. It was one of the smallest gaps that I could find. So they're sort of my exemplar high school. The other high school that I had was Arthur High School. And I interviewed 16 students, teachers, counselors, administrators, and white students were overrepresented by 34%. So their population was 75% students of color. So that makes 25% white students. And in concurrent enrollment, they had 59% of their concurrent enrollment courses were white students. So they were my non-exemplar school. Um, and I came up with um, four themes while I was working on this. The recruitment of the students really mattered in, 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 or the purpose of dual enrollment really mattered in the recruitment of the students. So we can see in some of the quotes here. At Russell High School, they were viewing dual enrollment, the opportunity to be in a college course, as a college readiness tool. So you can see here, they were saying, we're up to seven classes from college in the schools, University of Minnesota, those are awesome, but they're at a higher level. And you have to be in the top 20% proficient in reading levels and everything like that. Making a connection with a two-year college um, would have slightly more lenient requirements, and so they were working on that to open up the opportunities to receive college credit 
to more students than their top tier students. So they were intentionally adding a partner to engage more of their students. Um, teachers were seeing that students were actually being successful then when they were doing that. They were saying, you know, initially, I can't believe we have to do all this work, and now they're saying, I see why we're doing this. And this teacher on the bottom, you know, soon they think I can pound that essay out. So they're really seeing that this is a college readiness tool, and they are comfortable once you engage them in the course um, with the material. At Arthur High School, they viewed dual enrollment as only for their top tier students, which included very few students of color. And they continually came to the point of they're just not ready. They're not academically ready to be in these courses. If they were just more prepared, we would be able to have them. And it and continually came to it's a classism issue. It's a poverty issue. Um, and not recognizing that not all of their students of color were coming from poverty. So it was an interesting dynamic in our conversations there. Um, but they would say things like, if we had more teachers offering more CIS, their number one obstacle would be a fellow staff who's going to say, you're taking my AP kids away. So there was a finite number of students who could access these items. And if they um, did that, then we wouldn't have students to fill our other courses. Um, they also followed up with, and if the college and the school seems like a singleton, it's hard to structure. So if a teacher just teaches one of those and it's not full, then that puts strain on the schedule and causes problems within the classroom and within the teachers. Also, the strength of their college-going culture affected access to dual enrollment opportunities for students. So um, if the students at Russell High School had a really strong college-going culture, they really felt it. As the student says, I don't see it, I can feel it. Every teacher wants to help you succeed and grow. They really felt that. And I'm going to skip over two other quotes, but their, their counselors and their um, principal guided that. They didn't talk about minimum grad requirements. They talked about college prep. And the principal also said, 100% of my students go to college. And that was his driving force. We go to college. Arthur High School, on the other hand, their college-going culture was described as non-existent. And a few students were part of that. And in fact, one teacher here said, one third of our students are ready to go to college. One third are first generation who maybe need another birth boost and another third. I don't know what they're doing here. And so clearly, if we don't have a plan for them, we're not really sure how we're going to engage them. Um, and lastly, the really the key pieces here is that the composition of the dual enrollment courses create a narrative of who belongs in the courses. <laughs> and so at Russell High School, um, they talked about the fact that it was, it was definitely a mixed race. Almost every race was represented in Russell High School, and they really talked about this need. There's also some meritocracy in there that they deserve to be there, too. Um, and another student here talks about the fact that um, while we see some students in there, so he, ha he points out African Americans or Mexicans, they're not restricted, but they don't necessarily stay. So Russell High School still has a problem um, in some of their areas, but they are enrolling more students of color within the dual enrollment courses. At Arthur High School, if you focus here, um, one of the students says, I'm not even sure such classes are actually introduced to those sort of minorities unless they're doing exceedingly well than the rest of the students. This is a senior student recognizing that her peers are not in her classroom. And this is not an opportunity that she feels they get an opportunity to have. And then this student, Michaela, says, and you walk into class and you have a majority of mostly white students. And I'm usually maybe the only one of, of, or a few African Americans. And I feel out of place. And I feel like it's the huge elephant in the room. And everyone knows it. And the teacher knows it. And there's no one, you know, no one really says it. And I feel the pressure to prove myself. And they said this time again. I'm just going to show one more. Mm -hmm. um, and the majority of my friends are actually people of the color. And they aren't really getting told to be in those classes or that they fit in. And yet you see ki white kids mocking them saying that they, they use the phrase ratchet, um, very poor in quality, and that all this stuff, when it really doesn't make sense to me, how could they feel as if they were capable if no one had engaged with them to do the course? So these are students really recounting their experiences in there and feeling that there were, they had a lot of pressure as a student of color in these higher level courses. So I'm at the end of my time, so that's it. Thank you. Yep.